Hey, everybody. Uh, we've got a great one today, you know, uh, for a change. George Packer is uh, with us. George is one of my favorite uh, journalist authors. He wrote one of the definitive books on the Iraq War, The Assassin's Gate. His uh, latest, Our Man, Richard Holbrook, and the End of the American Century, was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. I, uh, I won five Emmys. George's piece in the June Atlantic Monthly, We Are Living in a Failed State, uh, talked about the coronavirus and kind of runs along the same theme, which is that uh, this country is a, just a goddamn mess. Uh, basically, it makes a strong case that the pandemic uh, has revealed our country's weaknesses. It's, it's pretty tough on America, and I hope you can, you can take it. I spoke with George about six weeks ago, and uh, I'm going to air that today. But I asked him to do a second interview about what has happened since, and uh, I'll play that first and then the longer conversation, which is a terrific one, you know, for a change. Since we spoke last time, of course, uh, a lot of things have happened. Forty more thousand Americans have died of, of COVID. Your piece was about how COVID had laid bare the shortcomings and weaknesses of our country. In your article, you, you did talk about that a disproportionate amount of, of uh, the deaths had been for uh, to people of color and to poor people. But you and I did not discuss race in that interview. So I wanted to get some of your thoughts about what has happened since George Floyd was, was murdered. My thoughts are dismay and horror at his killing and at the behavior of police in a lot of cities, in a lot of instances, who used excessive force on demonstrators that seems to be almost like a reflex of police departments um, to escalate rather than de-escalate, which uh, Black Americans know better than white Americans because they are policed more heavily and with much more aggression, according to data, than white Americans. So the video was a confirmation for some Americans and a shock for others, but it seems to have had a, an immensely energizing effect. And, you know, I'm still trying to understand the incredible scale of the demonstrations. I mean, not just in America, all over the world. This didn't happen with Michael Brown or Eric Garner or Philando Castile, also in Minneapolis, or any number of other high-profile cases of um, police killings that were caught on video. But it happened this time. So why? I think there are a number of factors. One is that there was just an accumulation of these recently. But more than anything... It was just the horror of that video. I agree. It's almost impossible to watch. I made myself watch it. And the, the clarity of the awfulness of what's happening, a man having the life crushed out of him, calling for his mother, who is deceased. He was calling on the spirit of his mother and asking for relief and people around him begging the cop to stop it. And the cop with an utterly nonchalant look on his face, it just had the, the look of the banality of evil. That's a big part of it. I think the quarantine had something to do with it because for three months, Americans were isolated from one another and confined to their houses, at least if they were able to avoid going to work. And that created a tremendous amount of pent up energy, frustration, while watching, following the news of the, of the pandemic, you know, tearing its way through communities and the just apparent indifference from the president. It was all enraging, but no one could express their rage, at least not in any way other than like online. The protests were like an explosion coming out of this period of repression that ended with the death of George Floyd. 
um, the, the, the opening up kind of coincided with his killing. So the other factor is Trump and his, his cruelty and his indifference to basic human decency and to the reality of millions of Americans whom he doesn't see and doesn't care about and doesn't see himself as the president of. I mean, the abandonment by the country's leader is also enraging and a cause for despair. And I think Trump, who isn't mentioned all that much in the protests, is there all the time as one of the prime causes. Obviously, it goes way beyond Trump, way before Trump. It involves us all, but Trump as a kind of wicked stage master of, of the whole thing is, I think, is inflaming the country and making it very hard for people to do anything other than simply take to the streets and express their outrage. I, I think that there are a number of results of this, one of which is a lot more Americans, a much higher percentage of Americans will say now than they did before George Floyd's murder, that there is systemic racism in this country. I remember when Hillary Clinton used that phrase in 2016, it was considered risky because it was a phrase that came partly from Black Lives Matter and that had not been accepted by anything like a majority of white voters or even Democratic voters. And now it's a truth that has to be spoken, and it's being spoken by a lot of people, including Joe Biden, who aren't just trying to get out ahead of the feelings of the public, but who who know it and know that it's so long overdue that we reckon with it and who are trying to find ways to address it that are in their lane, which is policy. And so that's what I'm looking at. What's going to come of this? What concrete changes are going to come? We have a change in language. We have a change in feeling in kind of like the where the sidelines are of what Americans support and think and believe about race in this country. That's changed dramatically um, in the last few weeks after some you know slow changes in the last few years. But what will come of this? in Congress and in city halls and state capitals. I hope that sweeping change is the result of this concrete sweeping change in policies. You, you have in, in your piece talked about uh, the pandemic laying bare, the weaknesses are, are the disparities in America between the affluent and those who are uh, working have to work. And you also talk about how, in in the piece, you talk about how people of color have borne the largest burden here in in many ways, including dying. Now we, we kind of had a moment here. A number of things came together. Is this moment going to carry us forward? Are things going to happen? Are police forces going to be reformed? Are we going to find a way to get rid of bad cops? Are we going to go to community policing? But it's more than that, because what you were talking about in the disparities in income, all the different disparities really have to be addressed. And will there be an impetus to do that? You know, George Floyd's brother, Terrence, spoke to a crowd and was urging them not to turn to violence. He said, that won't bring my brother back. Instead, he said, educate yourselves and vote. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the answer to your question. If people educate themselves and vote, if they're allowed to vote... If they don't have to wait eight hours to vote, if their mail-in ballots don't get lost, these are big ifs, then we'll see a, a, a change. I think we've reached a critical point where there's a kind of 
awakening of conscience across a number of issues among large numbers of Americans. Criminal justice and racial injustice are what we're thinking about now, and that may be the oldest, hardest, and most important. And then there's a whole new generation who are far more radical than our generation and who think in about global warming as the, the fundamental existential threat to their lives. All these things and, and more, guns, they're, they're not immediately related to each other, but they're part of a general surge of conscience that I see happening around the country over the last few years that has not yet been answered by changes in policy and in power. But that's the big question. And I think it's all going to depend on who votes in November. The book that is uh, the finalist for uh, the Pulitzer, our man, Richard Holbrook, and the end of the American century kind of is uh, it's sort of in line with the gist of your article, which is that this pandemic has sort of revealed us as a failed state and that the American century has sort of ended. Right. Well, there's a long way between the end of the American century and a failed state. Like there's a lot of middle ground a country could occupy between those two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, between world champion and, um, you know, and being uh, being Pakistan or Belarus, exactly. And I don't mean failed state in the textbook sense of Iraq after the invasion or Sierra Leone during its civil war. I don't. Mean, yeah, we're doing better than that. Yeah, I don't mean that. You know, there's outbreaks of armed groups all over the country fighting each other and that the police are no longer functioning and that the government has collapsed. That is at the end of the second Trump administration. That would be 2024. <laughs> um, yeah. What I meant was that I began to feel, especially in those first two weeks of March, when Ordinary people had to figure out for themselves, do I still send my kids to school or not? Do I still go into work or not? Do I ride the subway? Do I go out to dinner? Do I go to the theater for the night I have tickets? These questions were uh, hitting ordinary people without any guidance from the authorities. The government was missing in action. The White House was still telling us that this was going to disappear with the warm weather in April, like a miracle. We were on our own. There were no clear instructions and no obvious concern about the well-being of American citizens from our government. This was, for me, a new experience as an American, but I remembered it from my reporting in countries like Iraq. That's how c citizens of those countries felt all the time. And I suddenly had a little shudder of, is that really what's happening here? Because it sure feels like it, like we're on our own. And, and you don't, in this piece, and I'm going to read from it, in a, uh, I mean, you don't lay this all on Donald Trump. You can't, because he is an accelerant, you know, of bad trends, uh, but he's a symptom He's a symptom of a, of a broken politics and a, a really broken society. How could we end up with this guy as president unless we had already reached a fairly low point in our history? And for three years, we watched him operate and were spared any real crisis that would have made us understand what the cost of putting someone like this in power could be. We are no longer spared the cost. We're feeling the cost every day. But it, would, it was inevitable because he, he was incapable of being the leader that the country would need in a crisis. And spectacularly so. It's amazing how low we've now defined 
the Trump presidency so that if he goes into a mask making factory in Arizona without a mask and boasts about how well we're doing in mask production when in fact the shortages have been with us from the start and are still with us and no one blinks. It's just another hour in another day of the Trump presidency and his utter lack of ability or interest in showing empathy and in acknowledging the massive tragedy of 70,000 plus Americans dead. Um, we don't expect that from him. We don't wait for it. Uh, it would be shocking if he were to say something that seemed like a genuine emotion of sadness and compassion. It would be shocking as if he was not the man we knew him to be, but he can't because he's, he's incapable of it. So yeah, this is who we put in power. And so we ourselves, we Americans have to ask ourselves, how do we get to this point? If this is who is leading us in one of the worst crises in our history. This is from your, your piece so that everyone kind of gets the tone of it <laughs> as if they haven't already. Okay. When the virus came here, it found a country with serious underlying conditions and exploited them ruthlessly. Chronic ills, a corrupt political class, a sclerotic bureaucracy, a heartless economy, a divided and distracted public had gone untreated for years. We had learned to live uncomfortably with the symptoms. It took the scale and intimacy of a pandemic to expose their severity, to shock Americans with the recognition that we are in the high-risk category. Whoa. The crisis demanded a response that was swift, rational, and collective. The United States reacted like Pakistan or Belarus, like a country with shoddy infrastructure and a dysfunctional government whose leaders were too corrupt or too stupid to head off mass suffering. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, people, you have to gonna buy this damn thing yourself or go online. Um, but, I mean, really, did you have to be this hard? I admit I was angry when I, when I wrote this piece. I was angry. A lot of my work is, is reported work and tells the story of other people. And my point of view is always felt, but it's not explicit. In this case, I felt it's too urgent. It's too important to be prolix, to dance around things, to spend a lot of time uh, clearing my throat. And I think it hit a nerve because a lot of other people were seeing and hearing and feeling the same thing. Um, and it is shocking to see us flailing, uh, begging for <laughs> medical equipment from other countries, governors scrambling to find it themselves and competing with each other and being told by Washington, you're on your own. Armed protesters taking over the Michigan State House. I like that when that happened. I like that on cable news they go like, "Now we should say that that's legal. It's legal <laughs> to bring uh, right. weapons, to bring guns into the state legislature." Well, it's legal, <laughs> but you don't do it. I'd call that intimidation. It's clearly intimidation. It's totally beyond the bounds of protest. And it means that they're not listening. They cannot be listened to. This is just force, intimidation, coercion. And it's kind of the extreme of Trump politics, where instead of using reason and evidence and even finding some compromise, you get your way by coercion. And Trump, of course, loved it because this is what he likes to see. He had to be a little careful how much he backed it up um, because it apparently wasn't very popular with the American people. And that's something we should talk about because it turns out all the tricks that have worked for him and kept him in office for, for three years are not working. And I think he's run up against the end of the diminishing returns of his 
political style. It isn't just him, and th- and that's that's where maybe we should turn, because it isn't just him. the The list of institutions and failings of of the United States right now goes on and on, and the presidency isn't the full government. We have the United States Senate right now, where right now Mitch McConnell is just trying to shove judges in instead of really responding to this crisis. We we have no coherent national approach to this thing. We haven't had one. And that usually falls to a coherent president, which we don't have. And we had failures. Even the CDC, some of the institutions that we really believe in in this country and that in the past have been the leaders in, in the world, the CDC screwed up here. It did. It um, refused to use the World Health Organization test, and then its own test failed. And by the time it began to get going, we were right in the middle of full-blown crisis. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that was a a bureaucratic agency channeling the ideology of the administration, uh, America first, and refusing to go the route of cooperation and partnership which has been the impulse of the Trump administration from the start. But, you know, bureaucracies fail. No country got this perfect. And some countries that should do better have done badly, like France has done pretty badly. And the UK has done really badly. Mm -hmm. I don't think, Al, that any other advanced democracy has been laying explosives around the structures of government and trying to weaken them and blow them up for decades the way we have. We have had a powerful ideology that has said government is the problem. And when that ideology takes power in the form of the Republican Party, it then sets about to prove it by governing badly. And it's actually not that hard to do. (laughs) It's a lot easier to show that government is a failure than that government succeeds, especially when you are the government. So the result is should be expected. The government has done badly and the CDC did badly. And it has something to do with the fact that for years and years, civil servants have been maligned and government has been defunded and programs have been canceled and plans have been left to gather dust on the shelf. And that is all about an approach to government that has failed. Uh, And I don't think there's another country that has actively tried to undermine its own federal government as much as as this one. Well, Reagan, Reagan said the nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You know, Reagan certainly began the assault on government, but I don't think he envisioned the level of incompetence, nepotism, and corruption that Trump has brought us to. But in a way, there you can draw a straight line from those words from Reagan's first inaugural address to, uh, to the pandemic. Well, yes, but th- this guy has taken this to a new level. Uh, in this pandemic, he's he's refused to admit any mistakes, which means he is incapable of a, adjusting to reality. I mean, he wouldn't even say, okay, the thing with injecting the disinfectant, uh, that was stupid. I had a brain freeze. <laughs> I mean, w- how would that have hurt him? I guess so, right? The leader is infallible. Well, it's, hard for, it's hard for any leader to say I was wrong. I just was watching- On that- no, on anything. Above all on that, because he knows, he must know it was a, a colossally stupid thing to say. Um, and that's the hardest thing to own up to. You know what he said today? He suggests that Americans wash their hands with boiling water. Boiling water. Great. Yeah, to disinfect your hands. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's... Reached George, I'm trying to get a laugh from you. No, I'm too... <laughs> You're I'm, depressing I, me, I, Al. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't find him... You know, I, I've laughed at him in the past. I can't laugh at him. I, I, he's, he, I can't laugh at him. The whole purpose of my having you on here is I read this and I go like, George is down. <laughs> 
I'm I'm actually not down. I am a- I am angry, and anger is a kind of motivating emotion. It's it's better than just being depressed. But I find Trump's statements, first of all, tiresome because I've heard them all, and I don't expect anything from him, and it's, so it's repetitive and boring. But second, he's hateful because people are dying because of him. This is no longer about Russia Gate or Ukraine Gate or even about the one person who died at Charlottesville. This is about 70,000 people who are dead partly because of his profound failures. Let's just talk about other areas of <laughs> our uh, society. Besides, let's let's uh, get all our anger out here. Come on. <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, I had on the podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, the founders of, of No Kid Hungry, right? Uh, the New York Times has a piece that nearly one in five kids in this country doesn't have enough food. Okay? You know, you talk about what this pandemic has shown about our country. Yes. And it it doesn't just show that we have an awful president and that we have a Congress that isn't working. It's also showing just the gaps in wealth, the decay in this country. Yeah. I mean, that's why in that passage you read, I called it a heartless economy because we like to think we have a robust, innovative economy that leads the world. And I guess in some measures we do, but we have allowed ourselves, some of us, to forget what the cost of it is. And partly we forget because we don't see it, um, because our economy is now software driven and our uh, service workers are invisible. The, The package is left at the door. You don't see a human being. So that's, I think, a good thing that's come is that we have to think about them now. We, we've been forced to think, how do we get our food? Who slaughters it? Who packages it? Who ships it? Who delivers it? Um, who sells it at the supermarket? Who's at the cash register? That person we never even really looked at before. All of that to me is vital information that we need because we have shredded our social safety net and our worker protections, which have plummeted under Trump, but were never very good. And our union uh, organizing laws, which are now so profoundly anti-labor, this is the result. Children are hungry. Workers are sick. Families are going bankrupt. All of this is just a huge alarm that has gone off that we need to pay attention to and not forget because these are chronic problems that uh, are, are real. They're threats. They, we can't have a functioning democracy where a fifth of our children are hungry and uh, unemployment is 20%. It's sort of ironic in a way because of all this that has been revealed. You think about the primary season in the Democratic Party. This would have made Bernie's case. This would have made Elizabeth Warren's case very, very strongly in terms of protections for workers, in terms of the inherent heartlessness of our our system. And, you know, uh, I guess uh, conservatives or uh, free marketers would say, you know, capitalism has no heart. It just has a brain. Maybe they're right, but maybe that part of the brain <laughs> doesn't go to the other part of the brain, which is, you know what? Human beings need to eat. They need education. They need child care. They need a safety net in case something happens. They need everyone in the country to have access to health care. That, that's what my brain tells me and my heart. And I really feel that 
something about heartlessness also robs your brain. Is that profound? Not really. Sheesh. You're the you're the profound guy. You're no, guy no, the, you the, you 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 touched me the, there, Al. That was what you said is really. Yeah, I think what you said is true about the heart and the brain. I'm thinking about the the first thing you said about the primary and Warren and Sanders, and I think most Democratic voters don't have profound disagreements about these things. There's not a great deal of controversy on the Democratic side. And maybe they got caught up in lots of technical arguments about should we have a public option or should we go all the way and what kind of taxes are going to pay for it. And those are obviously crucial policy questions, but they're not questions about the vision of the voters. I think what the pandemic is exposing is what most democratic voters ordinary voters not the necessarily you know the donor class but the base of the party they know that and they they want a change and and this case. is not an issue with bernie at all or bernie supporters at all because as i say what this has revealed is so much of what Bernie has been saying, and his supporters have been saying, and Elizabeth has been saying, her supporters have been saying, but I also agree that we're all we're all determined to be in this together. This coming year or two, if a Democrat wins the White House, and especially if the Democrats take the Senate, could be one of the most fruitful and 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 active times in since maybe the great society in um, in Washington, because it's so long overdue. We've been blocked and bottled up and soaking, marinating in corruption and money for so long that there's just a tremendous pent up need and desire for reform. Okay. That's a perfect pivot for this interview because what you spoke to and what has been revealed by uh, this pandemic uh, goes beyond Trump. It goes beyond Republicans, Democrats, maybe not, because let's face it, what the Republican Party has become in the last, I don't know, 30 years has been increasingly ugly, including the, just the cowardice that we've seen among Republican office holders not to stand up to this guy. But what you're talking about in your article goes well beyond all of that and goes to the very the real weaknesses in our society and can they be addressed by a president biden and democratic senate with 50 or 51 senators i think they have to be i mean there are some fundamental reforms we need just to make government function again we might need the Senate to get rid of this thing called the filibuster that used to serve the purpose of forcing compromise and, and bipartisanship and is now just a tool for, for obstruction. The Democrats haven't had to use it very much because the Republicans aren't proposing any new legislation. Just ramming judges through it. Yeah, just ramming judges through. So Congress is no longer a law passing institution, but anyone who wants to address these deep ills that we've been talking about needs legislation to do so. And for that to happen, there may need to be drastic action in the Senate. Um, this filibuster has outlived its usefulness and is now just a, a tool of entrenched interest to block popular desires. Okay. I'm curious on something, uh, how you feel about this. And I have um, come to the feeling that we need to go to 15 justices in the Supreme Court. And I really resisted that because I don't like tit for tat. And that's what have the feel of that um, because this was, we, we have this 5-4 conservative majority because of McConnell breaking every norm. And also, very cynically, you know, he has said not very long ago 
when he was asked if a vacancy came open before next January, would he fill it? And he, he said, yeah, and smiled, a sly smile, according to the Washington Post. That a cynical says, smile. A cynical smile. Is that what it said? A cynical smile. No, that's what I say, because that's just pure cynicism. Yes. Power for its own sake. But okay, yeah, so, okay, so here's my reasoning on this as I've thought through it. Screw you. If, if you're going to do that, if you're that cynical, if you're smiling slyly in a cynical way <laughs> about this, saying, I just did this because I could. It was just power politics. That's all it was. Well, then how about, okay, all right, fine. We get 50. We get 51. We have the president. We're increasing the size of the court to 15. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is going to retire. Uh, Breyer retires. And that means we now have, let's see, 15, that's six. Uh, we now have eight new justices who are all under 30 to uh, <laughs> nominate and, and seat. Is that too cynical? Am I being too big a jerk here? No, I think what you're doing is <laughs> recognizing, and my God, Al, you uh, you served in that benighted body. You know that it's not on the level that the idea of that McConnell is just reacting to excesses by Harry Reid is just BS. It's satisfying because it's a acknowledgement that this is a power game and McConnell has played it well, but that's all it is. And if it's a power game, then when the Democrats have power, they're not going to be suckers. They're going to use it too. And they're even going to outdo the cynic in their cynicism. So it's satisfying that way. I don't know if it is a good long-term fix because it may well lead to more of the same. What do you think of the Senate getting rid of its own filibuster rule? Well, I I guess we have to now. I mean, I I was I was kind of against that. Obviously, a lot of this goes back to what 2014 was it when when we went to you just need the majority to seat district and and circuit court judges. And yeah. they accused us of uh going nuclear, right? The thing is... You will regret this, said McConnell. Yeah, and but when we did it, we met in the the old Senate chamber, no cameras, no mics, I mean, certainly no recording, and we wanted them to do a, a gang of 14. And that was in 2005, we had an agreement that, uh, you know, enough senators got together, said, nope, if if someone egregious comes up, we won't, we will get, gang up together and not not get them through. And that was because what was happening is they, the Democrats were blocking all of George W. Bush's nominations because some of them were pretty awful and outrageous. But they made this deal so that he could get actually good, reasonable, or a, least not egregiously awful judges through. Now what's happened on top of all of this is that they got rid of the blue slip. So they're just yep. populating the the federal bench with one Federalist Society 100 percent or after another. I think these are really important questions because they are the barriers to substantive change. And so any democratic administration, Congress has to be thinking it through now about what are the what are the key things. But beyond that, there's all the reforms we need to make sure that we don't have 20% of our children going hungry and uh, people on unemployment unable to pay their bills. Tick those off for me, for us. Well, policy is not my strong suit. I have to, I'll be candid about that. Other people 
know this stuff a lot better than I do. But as an informed citizen, I would say our tax structure has been more and more regressive throughout my adult life ever since Reagan. And we need to reverse that. And there are a lot of different ideas, whether it's a wealth tax or simply a higher income tax, reinforcing, you know, expanding the earned income tax credit, et cetera. There's a lot of ways to mm -hmm. do it. Um, the Democrats all were for a public option of some kind or another in healthcare. That seems automatic as a democratic policy position given uh, an election victory. Um, I think stronger labor law, because that's obviously what's missing from the lives of our quote essential workers is a union to speak up for them. They're getting fired for speaking up for themselves, um, for the most basic protections. That goes, of course, to the courts largely, but it also goes to Congress. Um, yes. But isn't it, isn't it interesting that Trump finally pulled the trigger, really pulled the trigger on the Defense Production Act on, on uh, meatpacking factories? Meat eaters are his voters. <laughs> if his voters... I think his calculation in, in that sort of shrewd reptilian brain was if my voters can't get their beef, they're not going to like me. So that's a crisis. You know, doctors and nurses without masks is not a crisis. That, let the governor solve that one. And, and screw, you know, screw the workers in those meatpacking plants. Most of them are immigrants, undocumented, nameless, faceless disposable, essential, but disposable. Or they're immigrants or the children of immigrants who are citizens, but they aren't real Americans. They have no voice. They don't have a voice. They don't look like us, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think that was his calculation. And honestly, you ask an American, are you prepared to give up meat for a month or two in order for those workers to be sure to be safe and well, and maybe even begin to get some protections in their jobs. I think it's a tough call for a lot of people. We've gotten used to an economy of just press an app and it arrives. It's seamless. Um, we're not thinking about the human beings who are sacrificing themselves in order to get it. There was a video of the Wisconsin Supreme Court where they were discussing this issue on COVID and there was some hot spot in one spot in, in, in Wisconsin and the chief justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, one of the justices brought up this hot spot and people dying and she said, no, no, that were people, that was people in the meat factory working in the meat factory. That was the hot spot. It wasn't the normal citizens. She literally said that. And she was articulating what a lot of people think without saying it. She wasn't being ironic. <laughs> she, no, no, yeah. no. You know, the definition of a gaffe is an inadvertent admission of the truth. Right. She, it was a gaffe, meaning it was her true thought coming out uncensored. So let me, let me, what was the blowback you got on this piece? Because you must have gotten just a tremendous amount of blowback, especially from conservatives and right-wingers going like, we're not a failed country, we're the best country in the world. I've never written anything that got more positive responses than this did, and more responses, period. This hit a nerve. Yeah, there were articles and some conservative publications and then some social media saying, you know, failed state. George Packer doesn't know what a failed state is. Actually, these were probably written by people who haven't ever set foot in one. I have spent quite a bit of time in failed states. I know what they are. That was just a, a pedantic way of trying to catch me. I wasn't using it as a technical term. I was using it figuratively to describe what the United States seems like under Trump and the pandemic. Um, so it didn't, it didn't feel as if I had really been uh, wounded by... It didn't hurt your blows. feelings, though, um, a little bit? No, 
No, in fact, I take it as a badge of honor. I mean, if they want to be defending Donald Trump's performance in the last three months, have at it. Good luck. We'll see how history comes down on this one. I don't think it's going to be good for them. I read a couple of these, and uh, some of them weren't defending Trump so much as uh, just taking issue (laughs) with uh, your analysis of this and the role of conservatives and the role of, uh, uh, you know, the factionalism and how how ugly it's gotten, which I completely agree with. But wasn't that part of (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, look, I've had conversations with conservatives, uh, respectful conversations in which we've argued about who's to blame and which side is to blame. Where does the partisanship come from? Obviously, both sides have some blame. You know, when you look, for example, we were talking about the filibuster a little while ago. When you look at the graph of cloture votes, which is the way to measure the use of the filibuster, it spiked to coronavirus levels when the Republicans were in the minority in the Senate, which was why Harry Reid and the Democrats finally pressed the nuclear button. So uh, there are these two very sage and judicious analysts in Washington, Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein, who've been following Congress for decades and who were very much of the let's look straight down the middle and try to be as even handed as possible for years. And finally, they start writing books like saying the broken branch. They're not both to blame the broken branch. It's the other guys. They were, they're crazier than you think or whatever the titles were. They finally had to sort of acknowledge this is not a blind lemming like march toward doom on the part of both parties. There is one party driving the polarization more than the other and moving further and further to the extreme and using more and more extreme tactics to get its way. And the reason it's doing that is because it is a minority party increasingly. And so it has to use extreme tactics, whether voter suppression or abuse of the filibuster or abuse of its majority power in the case of Merrick Garland. Or, I mean, in in terms of suppressing votes. Like the Wisconsin thing a couple of weeks ago, right? Yes, which is, um, no, you, we're sorry. We're going to take a case that has been decided <laughs> a state, on a state election by the district court and the circuit courts, and we're going to take it, and we're going to rule five to four, saying that no, people's ballots who get in, you know, absentee ballots who get in the day after the election don't count. I mean, it makes me wonder about Roberts. You know, everyone, every once in a while goes like, well, you know, um, he cares about the reputation of the court. Really? That one, I don't, I don't buy at all. No, I think that's right. And for example, in 2018, when a Democrat was elected governor of Wisconsin, the Republican state legislature immediately rammed through a couple of bills that took power away from the governor, Mm -hmm. power that the governor had always had, that the governor has in every state in order to keep power in the hands of Republicans in the state legislature. They did that in North Carolina to, to an extent too, right? And they did it in North Carolina. At that moment, there were some state legislators in New Jersey who, and who were Democrats who began to talk about, grabbing power for themselves, you know, in an equal and opposite way. And then they were made to stand down because national Democrats and others said, we're not going to abuse power. We're not going to show our corruption as nakedly as the Republican Party. Just don't do it. And they couldn't do it. They didn't have the support. And I think that's a sign that although both parties have their corruption, in fact, are riddled with it when it comes to campaign finance. One party has committed itself to power at all costs, and the other party hesitates to take those last steps. And we know which parties I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Remember I said I was angry? (laughs) Oh, am I getting you madder? 
You're not laughing anymore. Uh, no, I just uh, the, the Democrats aren't aren't great in some ways, in some respects. That's all I'm saying. Well, let's talk about that because maybe we shouldn't assume that if the Democrats come back into power, it's going to be uh, utopia. You know, maybe it's going to be more of the same. What do you think? Well, you know, it depends on a lot of stuff. No, I mean, Democrats are for a certain set of values. And I was really disappointed in this last, in that first package to address the pandemic, which had $170 billion in tax breaks for real estate developers um, and, uh, and investors, 82% of which went to people with incomes over a million dollars a year. There are things in that that, you know, you represent your state. And so very often people will go to bat for their state. That's that's the way the United States works. You know, Washington State has two senators. Boeing has two senators. Those two senators will go to bat at all costs for Boeing, the largest employer in the state of Washington. And they will be happy to compromise if, you know, very wealthy people get unconscionable tax breaks if they can keep their the people right. of their state employed. That to me feels like old fashioned horse trading. Maybe it's unseemly a bit, maybe they they lost more than they gained, but it doesn't feel like the level of nihilistic power pursuit that we've gotten used to from the Republicans in Congress. It feels more like Johnson era uh, backroom dealing. Yeah, but I've I've had senators say to me, you know, it's hard when you're meeting with people who maxed out to you, <laughs> not to listen. And uh, so, and kids don't have that. The one out of five children who don't have enough to eat in this country, they are they just do not invest in campaigns and I try to tell them to do that. <laughs> hey, I got to laugh. <laughs> uh, yeah, a grim. It, that was a grim laugh. That's by all the way. I asked for. I laugh. just want grim grim laughs. Okay. Like, huh? Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Well, I hope we can be the indispensable country again. You know, I I worry that this this pandemic marks uh, a point in history where we where we stop being that, and uh, your your piece in the Atlantic Monthly really underscores that. Really, we, I just so enjoyed uh, the time we spent together on on the radio, and uh, I'm glad to see this piece and our man Richard Holbrook and the end of the American century is something I will get in paperback. Way to go, Al. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I always enjoy it. And we'll do it again, I hope. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.